Hello and welcome to my presentation on the effects of aging wine on bacterial and yeast lees. Today we will explore how aging on lees can add positively perceived aromas that work well for certain wine styles, particularly in still white wines and sparkling wines. Aging on lees is a commonly used term and it is easy to say it so much that you forget what it actually means. So what exactly are lees? Lees is the accumulation of dead yeast and bacterial cells due to autolysis which is the natural and slow breakdown of yeast cells caused by hydrolytic enzymes. Legally, in Europe, it is defined as, quote, the residue that forms at the bottom of recipients containing wine after fermentation, during storage, or after authorized treatments, as well as the residue obtained following the filtration or centrifugation of this product. They also define three categories of lees. First are the clear lees, or wine deposits, that are obtained after clarification. They do not dry out completely and still contain a certain amount of wine. Next are the fatty lees, which contain less wine than the clear lees, and then there are the dry lees, from which no wine can be extracted. To finish up this legal definition section, a wine is called surly if no clarification is performed once alcoholic fermentation is finished. After autolysis, manoproteins and mannans are some of the main compounds released by yeast cells as they break down. Manoproteins have been pretty thoroughly studied and they've been noted to decrease protein haze in white wine, increase color stability, and promote growth of malolactic bacteria, which is perfect since aging on lees mostly occurs with white wines. They become present in the wine when the beta-1,3 gluconase enzyme hydrolyzes the cell wall glucans and alpha manosidases and proteases, subsequently releasing manoproteins. They are then suspected to bind to wine components that would typically aggregate and cause haziness. These cell wall manoproteins will also inhibit potassium hydrogen tartrate crystallization far better than the yeast manoproteins already present in the wine. An issue to note is that there is such an obsession with manoproteins that far less studies have been conducted on other polysaccharide related compounds produced by yeast autolysis. A study done in 2010 showed that concentrations of many polysaccharides glycosyl residues, except for galacturonic acid, increased by a statistically significant amount when the Chardonnay was aged on lees. The authors concluded that the enzymatic breakdown of the original polysaccharides combined with the presence of manoproteins increased the solubilization of many polysaccharides, even those that came from the grapes and not the dead yeast cells. The increase in polysaccharides in solution theoretically should improve the body of the wine, although a sensory panel was not done in this study. A couple interesting side notes. One is that the fermentation vessel may also play an important role in fermentation with lees. Total alcohols have been found to be higher in wines aged on lees in barrels as opposed to in stainless steel tanks. Lees were suspected to have adsorbed alcohols in a white wine aged in stainless steel, while no adsorption was observed in a white wine aged in barrels. As a general rule for lees adsorption, lees will take up non-polar volatiles and phenolic components. The other interesting point is that the fining properties of lees extend beyond flavor. It turns out that lees contact can actually reduce concentrations of ochre toxin A, a carcinogenic mycotoxin, by about 70% in white wine and 50% in red wine. Now let's move on to the use of lees for specifically still white wine production. The traditional method of lees aging is to clarify the wines at a late stage, which is usually about five to six months after fermentation, or to just keep them on the lees throughout the whole aging process with periodic stirring. A more recent method is to clarify the wines fairly early, only two to three months after fermentation, and to store the wine on finer lees that remain after the clarification. The most distinctive feature of white wine lees aging is the use of stirring, also known as batonnage. This causes the lees to be resuspended into the wine and arguably improves wine quality by increasing the amount of macromolecules extracted into the wine and reducing wine haze. I say arguably because the term wine quality can have slightly different definitions between different people, and while stirring may increase macromolecule extraction, it may not increase extraction of typically beneficial compounds such as esters. A 2009 study found that storing the lees had practically no effect on the sterification or ester hydrolysis reactions. In the results shown, total esters were actually higher in the non-stirred Chardonnay although not in a statistically significant manner for most of the time. Speaking of time, the length of aging on lees is clearly a crucial factor here. This is shown by a few of the extremes. 
For example, ethyl decanoate and ethyl octanoate, both of which give off fruity aromas, are at significantly higher concentrations in the unstirred wine than the stirred wine at 50 days. Ethyl octanoate is 1.2 times higher and ethyl decanoate is nearly twice as highly concentrated. As we reach the 140 day mark though, the relative concentrations are flipped with ethyl octanoate being approximately 1.2 times higher in the stirred wine and ethyl decanoate being close to twice as high in the stirred wine. It then begins to reverse yet again around day 160. This is probably due to the fact that the bonds between these esters and the yeast cell components are weak bonds such as hydrogen bonds, so these reactions are certainly reversible. The conclusion of this study was that stirring had a fairly small influence on the ester content of the wine. However, a different study that included measurements after approximately 300 days showed statistically significant differences between the ester content of a stirred white wine and an unstirred white wine, with the stirred wine having less. Other compounds are affected by stirring too. For wines aged on lees and barrels, furanic aldehydes that impart woody odors were shown to decrease with stirring, which indicates lees high affinities for these compounds. However, if you are trying to change alcohol content, organic acids, or terpenoids, you'll have no luck with stirring. These compounds are affected far more by the fermentation vessel than aging on lees. Clearly, much of the scientific literature has a tremendous amount of uncertainty, as a lot of these results can be dependent on yeast strain and grape variety. But one thing that is fairly definitive is that aging a still white wine in barrels on lees will generally result in a more well-liked product. A great example of this is shown in a 2010 study that tested aging on lees in barrel with and without stirring, as well as aging in stainless steel without lees. While the study was admittedly somewhat annoying to read since they did not have a wine aged in stainless steel with lees or a wine aged in barrel without lees, it does come to a fairly concrete conclusion that wines aged in barrels with lees will result in a better wine due to their sensory analysis test. The authors had 10 experienced judges do two tests. The first asked the judges to score wine color, odor, taste, persistence, and overall quality on a scale of 0 to 7. The second was a triangle test to see whether or not these three wines were even differentiable in the first place. The judges scored the barrel and lees wines higher in every single category, and the triangle tests showed that the judges could pick out the different wines in every single case. In other words, these wines were significantly different. It is also worth noting that the undisturbed Lee's wines scored highest in every single category but color. Next, we will discuss sparkling wines and their relation to Lee's. To produce sparkling wines without using carbonation, the base wine can undergo secondary fermentation in bottles, which is the champagne method, or in tanks, also known as the Charmat method. When comparing these two methods, it is clear that the Charmat method leads to a significantly higher concentration of fruity and floral aroma compounds, which makes sense when you think about how Prosecco, for example, is mostly made by the Charmat method. This stunningly clear and amazingly easy to read chart shows the concentrations of different flavor compounds for multiple different ways to produce sparkling wine, but we are most interested in T7 and T8 as both are fermented on lees and the former is the traditional method while the latter is the Charmat method. Darker red means higher concentration by the way. Let's go through the most important examples here. Linalool is significantly higher when the exact same wine is produced through the Charmat method and this compound is associated with floral and citrus notes. Beta damascenone also increases significantly more with this method and it imparts quince and floral aromas. Ethyl octanoate, a fruity and peachy aroma compound, is also noted to be higher. Other fruity compounds that are higher in tea include 2-ethyl-1-hexanol, ethyl-dodecanoate, and 2 nonanol On the other hand, the traditional method tends to result in more fatty aromas. Some examples of this are hexanoic acid, decanoic acid, and methyl tetradecanoate. This thorough study showed that the combination of using immobilized yeast and aging on manoproteins or lees will result in a higher quantity of beneficial flavor compounds. This chart here is a principal component analysis where PC1 explains 81.58% of the variability and is mainly related to ethyl hexanoate, ethyl decanoate, decanoic acid, and dodecanoic acid. PC2 explains 16.06% of the variability and relates to two non-anone, ethyl hexadecanoate, beta-damascenone, norolidol, 
and methylhexadecanoate. The important part of this chart is that all of the compounds on the right side are related to positive aromas in the wine, and all the trials on the right side of the graph include adding lees or commercial nanoproteins. Nanoproteins and other nitrogenous compounds released by yeast can also stabilize the foam in sparkling wines. A 2015 study tested multiple different varieties and found that the general trend was that the maximum foam height, foam height stability, and time of foam stability increased until 18 months of aging on lees and then remained approximately the same through the 30-month trial. Another benefit to lees is that they will consume oxygen and protect sparkling wine from oxidation. However, lees are only most effective at protecting from oxidation for the first three years of contact. This does not mean that it will not protect the wine anymore, as shown by the graph from this study. Finally, it is worth mentioning a potential negative of aging on lees, H2S production. If you add SO2, sulfite reductases can produce hydrogen sulfide after fermentation has stopped. Ultimately, if you are making wine and deciding your aging on lees strategy, it is best to do research on the strain of yeast you're using as well as the variety or varieties of grapes and determine the optimal length of time for lees contact and the vessel in which you want this contact to occur. Thank you so much for watching.